What we want to do is today is to facilitate an experience um, with all of us to increase our understanding of restorative practices um, while demonstrating how these practices can be um, promoted to improve school climate by strengthening people's sense of value. Um, and, um, and, and really, you know, just people's importance in the school community. So um, we want to increase your understanding how these practices can be helpful also just to build positive relationships between students and staff, staff to staff and with parents. Um, many, many of our colleagues that have gone through this have reported to us that they have actually are using this in their home as well with their children, with their spouse, with their families. Um, and it's something I've done for quite some time. So one thing that we want to do to start off is um, our community agreements. And um, community agreements are, we ask people to kind of develop those with us. I mean, we can list them out for you and just show you, but it's um, what we do. We encourage you to, as much as possible, to um, begin to invite the voice of your students, the, the, the voice of your staff, your colleagues, as they also um, have important ideas to include in the community agreements. And so um, I need to stop this, sh this share for a moment. And what we're going to do is we're going to um, use the chat. But what we want to do is we want to elicit some of your ideas of what you think are important community agreements, right? Things that help you to feel more valued, that make you feel more connected in your community. And so um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share the screen that allows me to actually uh, edit. What we have right now is confidentiality, right, which you all understand. And, and, um, and obviously, if you're working with youth, you have to kind of let them know, hey, we're mandated reporters. Just so you know, everything's confidential here. But if you mention that you're being harmed, or you're actually gonna go harm somebody else, or you're even gonna harm yourself, we're going to have to report that to get you help. That's important that you um, have that caveat. And then we say create a safe space for all, right? So we do our best to do that. And we say acceptance of where people are today. That means wherever you are, however you're feeling today, we embrace you, where, however you're coming today. Um, and we'll work with you in that way. All right, so if you don't mind, give us an idea, just put in the chat something that you would recommend. Um, there we go, so our responses are starting to roll in. Um, listen to each other. Hold a brave space with grace. Open-mindedness to others' ideas. Assume good intentions have a trauma-informed approach. I think we can include this with brave space. So we can do brave slash non-judgmental space. Uh, how about open communication? All right, so we've got confidentiality, create a safe space for all, acceptance of where people are today, listen to each other, brave non-judgmental space with grace, open-mindedness to others' ideas, assume good intentions, trauma-informed approach, open communication. And we have one more, speak from the heart. That's great, speak from the heart. So we wanna be authentic, right? Sometimes people will say, keep it real, you know, speak from the heart, even if you're feeling vulnerable. So what, I, what we wanna do is we, I wanna kinda of check, and Robert, if you don't mind helping me with this again, um, just, you know, we want to get a thumbs up. Like, for example, for myself, I say, yes, I'm, I'm going to say, yes, I, I'm willing to follow this for the next few hours of our time together. Um, I'll do my best. It doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect. But it, would, would you be willing, if you're willing to do your best to follow these, would you give us the thumbs up either in your video screen or give us the little um reaction from the reaction button you can give the thumbs up and robert if you don't mind just kind of look briefly we look go. looking through our gallery view saying seeing all thumbs up that's great thank you all for participating in that 
So um, one of the things that is important that when we do develop these community agreements, we really, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to, if we're working with students or staff, if I'm, a, if I'm like a educational leader and I'm working with staff, what, what's important is when we develop these, we remind people, look, the, the circle of, of community um, like involvement is that we are in some ways holding each other accountable, meaning these aren't rules for me to hold this, all the students accountable. This is for us to hold each other. That means students can hold me accountable and I invite that. What we say is, you know, when we're, we're, when we're in circle, we're no longer kind of like with this like hierarchical power position over somebody. It's about people truly doing their best to kind of say, I'm with you in this relationship, right? I honor you. I value you. And you have something to teach me as well. So I may be a teacher, but I'm also a learner. And I come with humility um, to the space. And now, this is something that we probably have to remind students over and over, because most students would find it very difficult to speak up and say, um, like, for example, it says, listen to each other. And if I felt, if I was a, a student, it'd be difficult for me to raise my hand and say to the teacher, hey, you know, um, you know, George was talking a minute ago and I felt like you weren't really listening, but that's part of our agreements, you know, but I want, we, you know, we, we want to grow student voice. We want to, what we call empower um, students. Now, some of us might be uncomfortable with that. We're like, what, you know, I prefer being in charge and, you know, yeah, but the reality is, is if we're truly about empowerment, we have to live it. And, and just in the, even the development of community agreements, right? I don't put up a list of rules in my classroom and say, okay, here's the rules, everybody, you're gonna follow these or there's gonna be these kinds of punishments because that, that's not restorative. Restorative is involving the community and, be, and building a culture where people will begin to hold each other accountable, but with kindness. So, um, we have this, you know, nice kind of looking photo up here of this, you know, man in a canoe in the middle of a lake and with the trees around, beautiful green. And, you know, we have like the, the title mindfulness. And, you know, most of us don't live in that kind of an environment, right? But what we want to do for maybe about a minute is I'm going to ask you to um, maybe use this visual if you feel comfortable with that, or you can close your eyes, whatever. But I'm going to ask you to do that with me where I'm just kind of going to take a minute to remind myself who I am as an educator, as a service provider, as somebody dedicated to serving my community. And as I'm doing that, I just kind of want to ask you to take some nice relaxing breaths nurturing breaths meaning every time we breathe it's a sign of life it's like it's like another you know not every breath is guaranteed <laughs> we don't know you know no none of us know how long we'll be on earth so it's a gift so we breathe in and then and then you know we we can even visualize ourselves in that position of in this by this lake or in, sitting in the boat and just breathing in the goodness. And as we look around and we see the trees, we know that we're in a relationship with those trees, like an interdependent relationship because they're actually consuming the carbon dioxide that I'm exhaling and they're producing the oxygen that I'm breathing. <laughs> So we're interdependent, right? And, and sometimes we forget that in our busy Western lives. So we say, let's return back to the basics and just breathe and be grateful for this amazing relationship we have with nature, this amazing earth that we live on, our environment. This is sacred work, right? We, when we say restore, Really, a, a word that's kind of, I guess, synonymous with that is to heal. So in some ways, we try to heal those broken 
harm people who are around us, right? We, we do our best to be a healer, a restorer. And many, we know that many people have been traumatized. So we just are mindful of that. And we, you know, we just ask for that grace to be able to be an instrument of healing and understanding um, with others. So uh, we do encourage people to um, do our best as educators and service providers to, to, you know, every day take a little time for that self-care to just remind ourselves who we are and to um, to kind of breathe, right? And, and remember our relationship with the earth and remember how important relationships are at our schools and in our communities um, that in Western culture, we've lost so much of the connection, the community connection, the relationship connection. And, and we see how people have suffered and are suffering greatly from that loss. And then it's been magnified by the COVID isolation. So we just are very aware of that. We want to kind of stay mindful of it and then do our best to become a restorative person with a restorative mindset so that every interaction um, is an opportunity to help people restore. And we have these uh, photos up here as a way to also remind us, like, if you can look at nature and nature can teach us such amazing lessons, if we just take a moment to, to, to be humble and to, to realize as we look at these penguins, we can learn from them. Look how they've developed a way to huddle together because they live in such a harsh environment. They come together and they know that they actually depend on each other for their very survival. And they work as a team. You know, some, sometimes they're in the middle enjoying the warmth and other times they're going to the outside and taking the brunt of the cold for the community. And they go in and out and in and out. And it's a way that they can thrive in, in such a harsh community. And when we look at the redwoods, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you already know this, but um, the redwoods actually reach out their root system to each other, to their neighbors and they intertwine their uh, root system as a way to communicate, as a way to, to heal each other in times of need, but also as a really important way to stabilize each other in their foundation, in who they are, so that when the strong winds come, they're not easily knocked down. Um, it takes a really, really um, event, like a climate event in some ways to, to, to knock those trees down because they're so intertwined in their community. And we say, that's what we need, right? We need our young people, we need our adults to begin to intertwine in their relationships and recognize that we are alike, that we need each other. Um, and there's such a strength in community um, but we know that we live in a society that is very, very, you know, individualistic and very kind of like, in some ways, can, can lean towards selfishness. And we just say, well, we need to listen to our ancient wisdom of our ancestors, because um, we've lost some of that. And so we say that the restorative practices actually is built on ancient wisdom, the indigenous wisdom from around the world. So it's, you know, obviously Native Americans here, but, but I mean, indigenous communities from Africa, from Asia, from, from Europe, from the Americas, from, you know, just First Nations. It's like that people have been sitting in circle for generations, for centuries. They understood that relationships are so important right? And if, if you really think of it, all of us, even though you may not think of yourself as coming from indigenous community, at some point, all of our ancestors sat in circle, right? They, they, they met in circle, whether it was sitting around a fire or some, somewhere, 
to be able to work in it as a family, as a community, that was the only way that they were going to be able to survive and thrive in a, in a very challenging environment. And so we know that we come from uh, wise ancestors who understood these things. For some reason, over these past years, we've forgotten much of that. So we say we want to restore it. <laughs> you know, it's in our DNA. We want to restore that. And, and, and we want to kind of, I guess, learn from, uh, for example, the Mayan culture has this greeting um, with each other that they would say to each other in Lakesh. So if I saw you, for example, you know, in the, in the community, I say, hey, in Lakesh. And you might say, Halakim. And it's, it's a way of me saying, you are the other me. And then you're answering, yeah, I'm the other you. And it's, it's really a, a way that their society has developed a way to remind each other. We're connected, right? I know we're separate beings, right? But we still are connected in our community. We're, we're human beings and we have that human connection that honestly, I would say in this culture, many of us have lost. We're trying to restore, right? Ancient wisdom where, where we will value every member of our community. So every, if you're working at a school, that every member of your community, both colleagues, you know, and, and students and parents would feel that they're always valued when, they're, when they come to your community, your school community, um, that they know that they're important and they have a high level of human dignity. Why is that? Because we choose to show that. We have very mindful, intentional adults who are committed to making sure that the culture of that school is flooded with that, this, this um, giving human dignity in, in every communication, both verbal and nonverbal, right? That's, it's really important. But we also understand it is important to be accountable to each other. So if I do something that's harmful, that I'm going to hold myself accountable and the community will, will hold me accountable, but they will do it also with that chance for forgiveness and for reintegrating in good relationship in the community. So it's not just, hey, I punish you and hope that you learn your lesson. It's no, we're going to help you learn your lesson. We're going to help you learn how important you are and how, how connected you are in relationship so that you would never harm people that you truly believe that you are the other, you're like their, their, their partner, they're like almost family. And so that's why we say that restorative practices really moves from oppression to empowerment. And that oppression, at least in our society, it, so much of it is based in colonialism, right? Of ownership and even ownership of people when we saw how, how the slaves were treated. I mean, what a what an inhumane thing, right? To go to Africa and rip people from their families, force them onto slave ships where many would die on the on the trip. And then and then when they got to you know to the United States, it's like now you're enslaved and you have to work for the in these plantations and this horrendous life. Um, but you also saw it the way the way native communities were treated by the by the colonists, right? By just, I mean, there's like an attitude um, that that was so oppressive that we have remnants of now, and we're saying we want to move away from that colonialism and and now work towards empowerment where people restore their human dignity. Um, yeah, it's really important part of this restorative work. So one thing that we want to do now is we actually want to do a, uh, a check-in circle with you. And, um, you know, I know we're, we're many people, so we're probably going to have to do that um, via chat. But um, I want to show you, you know, kind of how that can be done. And you can do it quite, kind of quickly using a one to 10 number scale. 
and the and one would represent you mean you feel horrible today. Ten would be that you feel you feel fantastic, but you may be a number in the middle, right? So just kind of think about it. How what number would on from one to ten would represent how you feel? And then maybe a one one sentence or a phrase to kind of let us know what that means. Um, and so um, I might say something like this. I might say, you know, today I think I'm feeling quite good. I'm feeling about a nine because it was, like I said, it was the first day I went back to a school district and gave a live presentation. And, and here we are today with our new series. And so I'm, I'm excited. I'm, you know, I have a lot of energy. So that's why I'm a nine. But if you're a low number, we really truly appreciate your authenticity. So if you're feeling kind of weighed down about something or you're having a difficult time, please be honest with us. And what we'd like you to do is in the chat, just put the number that represents you and then your little one sentence um, like explanation, if you're willing to do that. And I'm seeing nines and tens making progress. Wow, a 10 today. Way to go, Melinda. Um, and then I see a, a nine for Lara. Thank you, Lara. Pedro, yeah, an eight. Thank you for being here, Pedro. Um, yeah, he's so right on, all right? Blessed to have my health and family and job. Um, so look at all these. Just as after you type in yours, kind of look through here. You're going to see somebody can be an eight, and yet they, they're feeling overwhelmed with their return to school, but excited to work with students again. So you know what I mean? Like somebody can feel overwhelmed, but they're still saying, hey, I feel like an eight. Um, so just kind of look at these numbers and see like some people are stressed out. They're feeling like a six or, um, yeah, just kind of this, if you don't mind, just look through these. And if you find somebody as you're looking through it, kind of, you relate to them. I would invite you to send them a private message. Um, and you know, like as an example, like I see Linda says she's an eight you know, busy day, but always love attending trainings where I, I get to learn more. If you feel like, hey, you know, that's somebody I could really uh, like relate to for whatever reason, all you have to do is click on her name in the chat and you can send her a, a quick message. Hey, yeah, I'm feeling the same way. Or yeah, I, you know, I get that. Whatever. You're just telling somebody I'm with you, you know? Um, and if you, if you see anybody that has anything that you would like to respond to, please do that now. And thank you, everybody, for your authenticity. As, I, as I'm reading through these, I'm, I'm really seeing authentic answers. And it's, it's, it's really encouraging for me to see that. Hopefully, you had a chance. If you found somebody that you kind of relate with, you connected with, go ahead and send them just their own little message. Just let them know somebody in this circle, in this virtual circle, cares about you. That we see you, right? We recognize you. Um, so... Most of the time when you're doing um, these kinds of check-ins, you know, some, some teachers will tell me, well, I don't have time. You know, I, got, I work at a high school and I have like five different classes. I've got, you know, I, just, I was just at a high school district. And I think they were saying, I mean, some immense amount of students. I think they said it's a, like almost an average of around 40 students in the class. And I was like, whoa, that's rough. That's hard. And so, um, I was talking with them. I was saying, well, you know, sometimes teachers will do something as students are coming into their class, they do a, a, a research-based uh, effective strategy and they, um, they welcome them into the classroom. But they, they make an agreement with the students that they will all check in with that teacher as they're walking in by a one through five. And like if they if they were coming into the class and I see my teacher and I say, well, today, you know, I'm a I'm a three. <laughs> OK, so the teacher now knows how I'm feeling. But what if I come in and I, I, I tell the teacher well, I'm a one or I'm a two? So that alerts the teacher. Something's going on with Anthony. I may need to check up with them. Right. But at the same time, the teacher is giving her or his number as well. So, you know, they have their sign up and maybe they're feeling really great today. So they put up four or they put up five so that also the students are knowing how the teacher's doing as they're walking in, because sometimes teachers aren't feeling well and they've had a hard night or hard morning and they say two or they say one. And, and then you hope 
that the, the, uh, the students begin to feel feelings of empathy and connection because, because teachers are human beings first. They're not teachers first. They're human beings first with real life experiences going on, challenges. But sometimes, sometimes students stereotype teachers and educators like, oh, they have no problems. It's like they've got a great job, great education. So life is wonderful. They can't relate to me guess what? They can, <laughs> right? So um, yeah, we want, we want people to know that you're human. Um, and then uh, what I, one thing I really like is um, Robert developed this a slide that you'll have this slide, by the way, but if you notice, these are the different organizations and schools that are, that are present here, that are represented here. So you have, you know, different like um, there's Oceanside High School, Otay Ranch High School, Pioneer Elementary, North County Academy, Museum Charter, McKinley. So you see all the different organizations there. And um, so you may want to use a slide like this that you'll have, by the way, well, when we send this to you, you can always edit this but you could put the names of, of the students in your class around something. You can change the, 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 the middle picture, right? This just shows our county. You may want to use a tool like this. So I really am grateful to Robert for kind of creating a model that you can take and then change and use in, in your thing. Because when you have a, a large classroom, like, uh, you know, 30, 35 people, it's hard to keep track, if, especially if you're doing um, uh, virtual, right? If you're in person, you can use a talking piece, even though during COVID, we're trying to not use physical talking pieces. So we're asking people to use like a virtual talking piece. Or if you're going to use a ball, let it go to their feet, like a ball that they can just have their foot on and then have them pass it over like a little soccer thing or something, and then have them just put their foot on that. And that means they have the talking piece. It's their turn to talk and everybody knows that. But in a virtual format, you may need to actually point to, okay, here's Fallbrook High School. Here's this person. Here's GM Family Child Care. And here's Bohomi Park Academy. So you just have them speak and then you go to, the, it becomes kind of like a talking piece. So we're going to go a, a bit into, I'm going to ask some of you to kind of start to participate a little bit and, um, and just, you know, it's, it's a way to just ask people to start to engage. So Melinda, can you hear me? Would, would you be willing to read this out loud for us? And we'll just kind of follow along with you. Take your time as you read, read it and just see it. Melinda, as you're reading it, see if there's something that resonates as a part of it. Just, is there something that resonates with you? Sure. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Defining restorative practices. Restorative practices are based on principles that emphasize the importance of positive relationships as central to building community. They promote values and principles that use inclusive collaborative approaches. When broadly and consistently implemented, they promote and strengthen positive transformational school culture. Restorative practices also involve processes that repair relationships when harm has occurred. Accountability is achieved through understanding impact, repairing harm and restoration. Thank you, Melinda. Now, Melinda, was, is there a word or a phrase or something that resonates a little bit more deeply with you in this um, I think that the word inclusive is very important as well as values for me. Good. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. And Erica, what about you? What's, what's, is there something that you see that kind of resonates a little bit more with you? Um, well, the transformational school culture, because I was in a, another meeting this morning and it was all about like how we're coming back and how, you know, we need to be doing things differently because the old way didn't work. Uh, and so in restorative practices is part of having a whole different mindset and culture to to a school and welcoming, welcoming people back from a pandemic and, and such. 
That's powerful, Erica. Thank you for that. And Pedro, what about you? Um, is there any, any part of this that you feel kind of resonates a bit more with you? Um, for me, it was uh, also a little bit of that transformational school culture. Uh, we're coming back and, um, you know, uh, things have changed. And I think sometimes, you know, when we go back to a setting, uh, we have to be mindful and remind students that um, they're, they're here on, 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 on site. And so we need to um, get everybody up to speed and be mindful of, of the new, you know, whatever's going out there and you just kind of be cautious and, and, and take care of yourself. Wow, that's really well put. And thank you both uh, for bringing up that thing. Of, you know, we're coming back, but after a pandemic, right? So it's, there's a lot for us to really be mindful of. And, 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 and why go back to kind of the way things were when not everything was working well? It's a chance to reform and to transform so I really appreciate those, um, those comments. And um, Joshua, for yourself, um, is there anything in this definition that kind of resonates a little bit more for you? Building community and promoting values and principles. I think that as providers, that's like our highest responsibility. We tend to come in contact with a lot of students who don't have positive values or principles. Um, and it's kind of up to us to build that type of community in the environments we're creating. That's fantastic. Thank you, Joshua. I appreciate that. And Linda, what about you? Is there anything that resonates with you on this? For me, it was the consistently implemented because any of us can say well you know we're going to make a change but to hold ourselves accountable is something different and so ensuring that you're doing things with attention and you know that you're going to have that consistent basis or else it's not gonna it's not gonna happen the way you would like it to all right linda that was excellent thank you and, and like i really like that idea of it it really needs to be consistent it needs to be, you use the word intentional, and, and you might even think of it needs to also be strategic. So, so all of those, you know, need to be happening. And so I always try to you know, mention to people, you know, whether you're a teacher or not a teacher, you're always teaching. Um, whether you like it or not, people are watching you. They're learning from you. They're learning from you. even your facial expressions. If you frown at them, they're learning like, oh, you're not, you know, you're mad or you're not safe. You know, they're interpreting in their minds. Are you a person that's safe to approach or not? So we're constantly teaching by the way we respond, the way we listen, our, you know, the, the way we look at people. And so um, what we say is, maybe we should be more intentional and strategic about the way we teach because we're teaching all the time. So let's, let's, let's teach what we want to teach, right? Let's teach um, how to care for each other better, how to make people feel more valued as a human being, um, make them feel a, more of a sense of belonging. And, and, and I would say we're kind of working to try to restore hope in public education, right? Like everything that we do is kind of trying to restore that. So um, thank you everybody for um, doing that so well. So I wanted to kind of also just show this video. Some of you probably have seen it, but I wanna kind of show it for those who haven't seen it yet. And it basically, I think gives a good picture of what would it be like, you know, like if you're in a school where they're not really intentional, they're not being strategic and, and they're not focused, they're not being mindful about this. What does that look like? And then what does it look like when a school is intentional and they are making every effort to communicate those messages? Hey, Mr. Q. Did you see that? Why would somebody do that? Please go into the classroom, no talking, quietly. Hey, Ms. Merida, how you doing? We need you inside. How do you think that makes us feel? I forgot my number. What's your name? Jordan. What's your last name? Carter. All right. Go ahead. 
School is hard enough. Come on in, sit down quietly at your desks and begin writing. This kind of stuff just makes it harder. I said quietly, please. Who's talking? Is it you, Sophie? Don't let it be you. Don't believe me? Sophie. Please just watch. I'm not up here for me, I'm up here for you. Pay attention, okay? Now somebody answer me. Somebody needs to answer me really fast. Every time we're ignored or yelled at or silent, the the teacher takes away what's possible. No horseplay, no running, and especially no talking. Moment Kids. by moment. Ms. McGarity, your students' behavior yesterday in the lunchroom, it was terrible. Next time, silent lunch. Did you hear that? Stay in line and catch a bubble. I'm not playing. If this is education, we're in trouble. Bye, Miss McGarity. Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. The way it is now, two of the three of us will never be able to really read. It doesn't have to be this way. Hey, Jordan, how you doing? Good. Good. Everyone we meet throughout our day can make a difference. I've been waiting for you to arrive. All the difference. Good, how are you? Great. Hi, Jordan. Bye, Jason. Good morning, Jordan. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. How are you? Good. Go ahead and put your number in. Talk with oh, us. Not at us. That's okay, I'll look it up for you. Go ahead, sweetheart. Okay. All right. Have a Teach good us day. what we need to know. Good morning. That's how we get smarter. Well, good morning, Sophie, Janicia, and Jordan. And when you talk with us and teach us, give us bigger and bigger words. Now what I'd like you to do, children, is turn around and converse with your neighbor and discuss where the mother might have gone. Words that we can use to read and understand. She is prey for eagles, so she hunts at night. And that will take us places we can never reach without you. Remember, we're entering the learning zone. Now how can we show our respect to the children and teachers who are working? We can walk quietly. Yes. Okay, kids, so what I'd like you to do is continue writing your narrative, documenting your emotions, if you were the baby owl and your mother abandoned you in the nest. What can you do? Learn all that you can so that you can challenge us to be our best. You would have stayed and assisted them in whatever they needed. Share yourself with us and show us how to share ourselves with others. Give us courage. Give us compassion. Help us find our own voices so we can become who we are meant to be. I, it's really, you know, we just wanted you to kind of like reflect on that about like, you know, the teaching is happening all the time. And the hope is that, you know, that, that we actually can get the whole school to buy into this, the, the bus driver, the, you know, the cafeteria worker, the teacher, the administrator, that if everybody is giving this message all the time, we're going to have a, a, a school full of students that they have no doubt that they are cared for there, that this is a place of, of human beings who truly do you know, care for them and that they're wanted at the school it makes a, a big difference. And Laura, I just wanted to ask you, what, is there anything video that resonated with you? I appreciated both videos and the juxtaposition between the two. You know, it gives a good illustration of step by step in a young student's day, um, what it could be like if each consequent step they were met with not having that dignity or um, the relationship was not forefronted or honored at all. And then in the second video, just seeing step by step again a parallel experience where dignity was always honored. And I mean, like I personally felt, you know, welcomed through, you know, an empathetic sense of, of Jordan's day, um, be it with the bus driver and the lunch teacher and the principal and seeing that whole school wraparound was wonderful while also having high expectations for learning because that's what students are there to do. That's 
Great. Thank you, Laura. That was an excellent um, insight. And then Julie, what about you? What did you, what resonated with you? The end of the, the video where we got to see them transform into the people that they're supposed to be and thinking how they're going to take those types of interactions out into the world and be those type of people that are going to be welcoming and, and um, sharing with making other people, children, adults feel welcomed and accepted. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you, Julie. And, you know, I was thinking when you were talking, Julie, it was reminding me, it's almost like the school has a number of different circles within it. You know, the relationships that exist in the classroom and the relationships with the other people. But then those circles really are connected with the circles of the community and where these students go right into their colleges and workplaces and families. And those circles are all impacted um, by that. So thank you for that. Um, and so um, now what we want to do is we want to do what's called a, um, like we call it either a pair share or this is going to be a triad share. So some of you have heard of this empty the cup um, by Ernie Mendez. And what we do is we say we want human beings to come together to try to find commonalities, to, to listen to each other, to grow in understanding. And we, we've noticed this, that all human beings usually are carrying some kind of concern, right, on, on, on their mind. Um, I have a real concern with um, somebody in my family today, and she's having a, a legal issue actually this afternoon. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm praying for her. I'm real concerned about her. And then, um, but one thing I'm grateful for is, honestly, I'm grateful for my faith, because um, I'm a person of faith, and I I feel like it's not all on my shoulders. Like I can't control everything, but I feel like my faith allows me to kind of release those things that are too difficult for me. Um, and I, I, I just feel like I get a sense of help. Um, so it's, it's a real positive thing for me, um, especially in those challenging situations. So what I'm gonna ask is that we're gonna go out into what's called triads. And I know some of you, uh, may not be comfortable having your um, your camera on just yet, but when you go into the triad, if you if you can, please turn on your camera so that um, your your the three people can see each other in there. And we're going to ask you this: answer these two questions. What's one concern on your mind, and what's one thing you're grateful for? Just it'll only take you know maybe five six minutes to be to, you know for you guys to do that, but be authentic. Be a real human being with each other, if you will, and listen and try to listen for understanding, grow, grow in that understanding. And maybe you might find some commonalities or even feel some feelings of empathy. You know, if you don't mind, um, Robert, how about just starting with you? What's one concern for you and then one thing you're grateful for? Oh, just maybe with uh, with concern right now. I know I there's it's a it's concern and excitement. You know, I, I think uh, just with the some schools reopening, of course, everyone else, um, you know, in in deep preparation mode to to start uh, start reopening. Just just concern because I know there's there's so much energy of trying to get it started, but there's so much to to worry about still with uh, with, with with the variants and 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 uh, expectations with. With mass and 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 just a, a lot of a uh, lot of things to, um, it's just just be concerned about. But I think just uh, just that gratitude too is that there are so many. Uh, just uh, also also knowing that there are so many people um, that are, are are doing their best to get this reopening at least started in, in the safest way that it can. Um, I, I just include this, this training and all other other interaction during the summer and this past year. It's always just encouraging to know that there are so many dedicated uh, and capable staff that are doing their best to get schools reopened and, and, and students uh, 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 get students the best care that they can. But uh, it's definitely a, a mix of those two right now, for sure. That's great. Thank you, Robert, for, you know, that, that was really powerful. Just your authentic answer to that. Very real. And, and um, I appreciate it. So, Laura, what about you? Um, but, you know, coming into this training today, there's a former student that I had in 2009 
when I was a counseling intern at Monarch who reached out. Um, she's soft-spoken and brilliant and um, has had, you know, a share of challenges in her life. And she just got admitted to UCSD on a full-ride scholarship. And they um, then told her that she had to go through an appeals process because she missed one class. And um, it was an, a small oversight. And she, what was wonderful is she reached out. Um, she's not someone who I'm very well connected with her family. And she's someone who has so much skill, so much capacity, and really likes to do things on her own. And so it was brave that she reach, reached out um, so that, you know, my, her case manager and myself can make sure that she gets in on that full ride. Wow. That is some powerful, um, what, a, what a great testimonial to your connection with your former students and how you've maintained that, that relationship and how they trust you to reach out. I mean, this is a, that's a very scary time for a college student and then to, but to reach out to you you know that they trust you and that they feel like you're you're um you're worthy of bringing into that circle of of challenged you know so kudos to you um lana thank you and rosa i, I don't know if you, if you heard that we're sharing one concern oh she so she um Oh, I think it was just, just rejoining. May have lost connection from. Uh, oh, okay. Remote. There we go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, th and and really, what this does is it gives us that chance to kind of listen to each other and kind of begin to recognize commonalities, um, you know, in our concerns and our gratitudes, right? Um, and um, but just I don't know. It's sometimes it's funny that sometimes our concerns can also be connected with our gratitude. Um, and so it's, I, I think as people listen to each other, I'm hoping that that's happening in these small groups right now, that people are growing in that human connection and being reminded, you know, even like as Laura was talking about her former student and, and what, a, what an amazing long-term relationship because it started when she was 2009 and here we are in 2021 and and maintaining that relationship and laura it's something i've seen that is very you know relationships with your students for in, at least from what i can see um now in you is that they're long term they they don't end when the school year ends they're there's something that you truly value them as a human being not just like as a person you're serving that year it's very powerful for me to, to see that. And, and I think we all kind of need reminders of that. Um, because as I, as I listen to people, um, they, they tend to tell me um, it's those people that went above and beyond for them that made that difference. Those are the people that they will say when I ask them, who's a restorative person that made a difference in your life? It's people like you, Laura, that have gone above and beyond the norm right? You don't just kind of do your job and that's okay. But you, you, you truly put your heart and soul into it. And that's what makes a difference. That's what helps people feel like somebody actually cares for me, you know? Um, so it's, that's, that's what we're trying to project. And I appreciate everybody. Um, thank you everybody for engaging like that. And, um, Miss Celine, can you hear me? Yes. So, um, I want to ask you, were you able to um, um, possibly grow in understanding of your two other colleagues um, and, and maybe even, what, why don't you tell, tell us what your experience was like? Well, what I shared was like my concern is um, my son is starting kinder at the end of the month. And my concern is pretty much what I saw in the video, the, the, the communication he's going to have with adults, that interaction and the effect that that's going to have on his development. And, but the, the positive that I'm trying to focus on is that now I truly understand the parents when they're dropping off their child for the first day of school or for kinder. And I can really um, understand and make our relationship stronger because I know what they're going through. Wow. See, that's, that's powerful, right? I mean, honestly, I, I know it sounds strange, but that lesson right there, 
would be worth this whole workshop. Literally. I mean, to me, that's how valuable that lesson that you, you explained is. So thank you. Um, and Tara, can you hear me? Would you be willing to share your, your experience? Um, yeah, I was, I'm concerned. Uh, I'm always concerned when we start a new year. <laughs> um, I feel like it's the hardest part getting to know new faces, new parents. Um, and then my, um, what I'm grateful for actually is some of them are here is for, uh, some of my cohorts, like their support, um, in starting the year and being able to like ask questions and seeing uh, what they're doing at their schools and things like that. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we noticed that sometimes the concern is connected with the gratitude, you know, like your school community, you're concerned about coming to school, but, but there, those colleagues of yours are also something you're grateful for. So it's, it's powerful that way to, to hear um, how, how this works. So um, what we encourage people to do is, yeah, when you can, you know, really try to find a way to check in with your students or your even your colleagues, and then try to like set aside a little time like that where people can go into a triad and just connect, right? And they, it even for us, it just helps us to reflect, hey, what am I concerned with today? It's almost like a self-check. And then what's also something I'm grateful for, sometimes we have to dig deep and we're like, oh yeah, I am grateful for that. So um what we want to do is we want to take a five minute break and just ask people to kind of just, you know, go stretch a little bit, go get some water, do whatever you, you want for five minutes. It's, um, I have 204, so we'll start about 209. Um, so I'll see you back then. One thing that we did is we provided you within the PowerPoint um, a couple of uh, like an, another type of pair share, triad share that you can do with staff or even with students, you're going you're gonna to be the one to, um, to read if this is appropriate for your culture and for the age and all, everything like that. One thing I, I do think is important is for us to learn from people what has been this pandemic experience with, you know, for you. And then what have you learned, right? Because really we have learned things. And a lot of times I, I kept hearing people, you know, really nervous, anxious, um, complaining about the amount of learning loss that kids have gone through, which I understand they were talking about academic learning. But what we say is there's also a lot of life learning lessons that were learned that are going to be forever taken with those young people. So we want to honor those things. And I understand that we need to also be attentive to the um, the academics, but we should take some time to, to honor the learning gain um, that people have experienced. So one thing that we um, just feel is important to cover as a part of this restorative justice practices is the school to prison pipeline and what that means. Um, that, you know, the basic idea is that um, for many years, our school system used punishment as its primary tool to change behavior, to manage behavior, thinking that, okay, if we come down kind of with a stronger punishment of somebody that was um, misbehaving or whatever, that, that they'll step back in line, right? They'll, they'll start to manage their behavior better. What we found though through, um, I guess through the data over, over a number of years, is that um, there were there were a number of kids who know that it didn't work for them. It actually was the opposite. It actually made them feel um, less connected uh, with the school. Like here, we're wanting to reconnect them to the school, and actually, we're doing the exact opposite. They're feeling pushed out. They're feeling unwanted, um, not important, right? Not connected. And so what ends up happening is those students tend to not care as much. They're not attending well. They're not engaging in the classes. And pretty soon now they really become a behavior problem. And, uh, and so what, what schools did, though, was they just punished them harder, right? Suspension, expulsion, 
And, um, and, and then we, we really found that certain groups of students um, were pushed out much more, just even nationally, when we looked at the data, we were like, wow, look at how many kids had experienced this, um, like an overwhelming use of punishment upon them, right? Um, and so it was like a disproportionate amount of, of, of that isolation. Um, and so, um, and we found it to be, it, a lot of times it went down the racial lines for African-American students were, were a way more uh, kind of the victims of that. And, and some other groups as well, including um, students with disabilities, and, 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 and sometimes Latino students and others, but I, we wanted you just to be aware of that because what we're talking about is like, it's almost reversing the harm that's been done. That's an injustice. So now we're saying, how do we do restorative justice practices, right? To, 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 to intentionally move this work so that that especially those who have been so um, uh, demeaned and devalued by a system of injustice, how can we now help to restore their sense of belonging, their sense of being wanted and cared for? Um, but we understand that that takes extra work. It's, it's, you have to go above and beyond. Um, just like we would do for a student with special needs, we say, oh, we have to provide these special accommodations, a bit more extra support. Well, we say a lot of these students that even just coming from a family, uh, from a, like where there's been generational harm within the school system and with, within society, they need additional support to be able to regain trust again, right? So any of you, you all know this, when you've been harmed in relationship, either a friend betrayed you or you were bullied or anything like that in life, it took a while for you to regain that trust if you ever did, right? Because it, it is such a deep scar. And so we are saying, hey, that's why we call this restorative justice practices, right? We want to, to really truly create a school that is um, truly uh, um, developing a, a system of equity where we know that certain students need additional supports and we're gonna provide that to them because that is the just thing. It's the right, righteous thing to do in many ways. And so when we look at this shift, this is kind of what it takes. It takes kind of like that traditional discipline kind of uh, shifting over to a restorative sort of discipline, uh, you know, where, where you're not just so concerned about schools and rules, the, the rules and things like that being violated, you're, you're more interested in the people and the relationship. So it's, it's really about the human beings above the, I guess, what, uh, what would be considered like the um, like rules being broken. And so one of the things I like to um, encourage people is within your school, within your organization, to try your best to always prioritize the human beings above all the other practices, all the other kind of state standards and grades and attendance and money and this and that, that the human beings should always be the top priority. And we should be um, intentional about the, the way we truly live that out. And so we have this fundamental hypothesis. And, um, and I'm going to um, see, uh, Tara, would, would you be willing to read this for us? Human beings are happier, more cooperative, and productive, and more likely to make positive changes in their behavior when those in positions of authority do things with them rather than to them or for them. That's great. Um, Tara, what, is, what does that kind of mean to you in your own words? I think that it's more about teaching them than, than doing for um, when we partner 
with kids and help them understand the process or the reasoning behind some of the rules or the expectations, the kids are more likely to understand what we're aiming for versus um, like in the video, they said uh, there was an issue in the cafeteria. You, you need to have a bubble in your mouth, but why? Why do the kids need to have a bubble in their mouth? Why, what, what are their actions doing that are impacting other people on campus? Why is it important to walk in the hallways quietly? Because maybe there's other classes that are still running and the kids sometimes, even adults sometimes don't understand that um, our actions don't just affect us, they affect others around us as well. Wow, that's very well said. Thank you for taking the time to, uh, to do that. And so when we look at this, um, what it's talking about is, is restorative practices has a continuum of different kinds of practices, and they're certainly not um, comprehensively explained here. This is just kind of like a um, an overview, right? And it goes from the informal practices all the way to the formal practices. And the informal practices are the things that we should be doing every single day in our restorative, it says here restorative language, but I, I kind of prefer the, the term restorative communication so that you're in, intentional about the way you're communicating, which includes in the way you're listening, the way you're responding and your and your body language, um, and then you're making sure rather than just assuming that you kind of know all the answers and all everything that's going on with another human being, you actually are asking restorative questions to find out what happened. You know what what tell explain to me what was going on in your mind. Um, you know and and even getting ideas from them of what do they think needs to be done to make it right. Um, and then, you know, that we're having these small impromptu conferences where we actually, you know, sit down with one or two people and we have this conversation that communicates with them their importance, that we, um, we're going to walk with them to find solutions to, to, to any kinds of problems that they're experiencing. Um, and then like the group or circle is kind of a little bit, I know we're doing this in a virtual format, but it's like what we're experiencing. It's like the, the circle. Um, and what does that actually do to help to build community that we're intentional about doing this often? Because we know that in the circle, people can see each other. It's not, I don't know if you remember in that, in that video we saw in that first example, when they were sitting in the, in the room, in the, in the negative example, they're sitting in rows and really kids are seeing the back of someone's head, right? And then, then the, the teacher has them in the second example, she has them in collaborative tables, right? They're in groups of six and they're seeing each other, right? That's really a very basic and important change in um, kind of the environment that you can create and, and circles help to create an environment where people will see each other and, 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 and be responsible to each other and accountable to each other. Um, and then we know that sometimes there's really kind of, um, I guess I would call it significant harm that's been done where we need to have a formal conference, right? Where we, where there's, I've done these um, many times. And so they're, they take a lot of work. Um, and yet they're very necessary in those kinds of significant harm situations. So um, think of it this way. <laughs> Restorative practices should be done all the time. They're just done at different levels. Uh, Tamara, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Tamara, would you be willing to read through this um, slide for us, please? Okay, restorative practices all the time. Develop a caring community where all individuals feel a sense of belonging, value, and importance. Every interaction teaches, so we must be intentional, strategic, and consistent with how we communicate with each other. Teaching and learning intensifies as we are responding to harm, 
accountability and support are provided together. Uh, the entire community is responsible and accountable to each other. And every community member is an important resource to help the community achieve the goal of building a caring community. Thank you, Tamara. And uh, Tamara, as you were just, as you kind of just look over this one more time, just is there a, a part of one of these that resonates more deeply with you? I guess just that every community um, member is responsible and accountable to each other. Uh, that there's no hierarchy and that in humanity. And so it doesn't matter your role in the, in the educational environment. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, she's, you're right on. I mean, especially in that when you're building a restorative community, it should be not that hierarchical top down. I'm above you. I'm better than you. I mean, that is really, that's a colonialistic kind of thinking that is very harmful to human beings. We, what we're saying is we are human and we actually have that same human dignity. Um, it's not something that we have followed in our history, not even in the United States history, but it's something that we're working towards. So thank you, Tamara. Thanks. Um, and then um, Robert, what, what about you? Is there a part of one, one of these that resonates a little bit more deeply with you? Well, I think, I think for, for, uh, for me, it's, just, it's, it's a repetition of this one, but just every interaction um, be, being the opportunity. And it's kind of been a good self-check for, for myself to think like, am I interacting in certain situations uh, differently, whether it be with not necessarily who I'm interacting with, but maybe how I'm also feeling or how, what, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, attitude or presence I may be bringing into a into a situation, but just having that good self check of reminding myself that you know this is um, you know this is that ch uh, chance to be consistent and 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 broadly um, applied. So just trying to remind myself that it's every interaction. You can't just be selective about it. Yeah, that's a, I, you really put that well, Robert. I really appreciate the way you explain that because I think we're all in that kind of battle to try to be more intentional, or you kind of said to be more conscious of it, um, to live in a more mindful, conscious way, but it's not easy. Um, and so we try our best to kind of build uh, sort of practices that help remind us of, of that. Um, and then Laura, can you hear me? Yep, here I am. Okay, so it, what, what, is there any one of these that resonates with you? Similar to Tamara, it's hard to pick just one. Um, I might select if I you know, had to choose. Every community member is an important resource to help the community achieve the goal of building a caring community. Um, I see that in every community, there's so much wisdom within each and every member. Mm -hmm. And it behooves the community to um, see that wisdom as having potential to inform the whole and rather than make assumptions um, it's to have these circle check-ins to really get to know who you're sitting next to and what they have to teach you. Wow. That's powerful, Laura. And I, and, and I'm, you know, privileged to know you and, and work with you and collaborate with you. And I know that I've, I've really seen how you honor young people and you truly, I don't mean you just say it by lip service, but you really believe it. And, and you say that young people have so much to teach us. Um, and even though you're an adult and your mom of three, and you know, you have a lot of experience, you still, um, you know, can you feel like, and I see the way you treat them and you, you know that they have something to teach you and they have wisdom and they truly are a resource. And, and I believe that's why young people respond so well to you is because of your humble, open-minded attitude. So um, thank you for that. So when we're looking at the MTSS, the multi-tiered system of support that really all of our schools in California are um, kind of mandated to um, develop some kind of system of support um, there used to be more of a system of kind of discipline, <laughs> you know, that's the way it was, you know, um, where you get more and more disciplined as you, um, I, I guess, as you, as the less you responded and the less you kind of complied with the rules, you got more and more kind of disciplined. 
Um, so really what, what, what they're saying is we want to develop a, this pyramid that is a system of support where in the bottom part of that pyramid, what they call tier one, those are called the universal prevention practices. And that, that's, that's what every student on your campus should be able to be a part of. So they should all be part of these you know, relationship building circles and the social emotional capacity building, right? Developing responsibility for self and others and um, you know, building restorative language and dialogue and all of that, right? They should, all students should, should have access to this bar, you know, no, without excuses. But we say this, that some students need additional support. So then the tier two practices, they're probably going to go into kind of some form of like group support, small group support. And, um, but the idea is always to provide them interventions that will ultimately provide them the supports so they can reintegrate into those tier one classroom practices, right? Um, and then sometimes they have the, the need for the tier three and, and, um, and that's, you know, because sometimes those harmful situations happen and they might need to be involved in more uh, formal um, kinds of practices. But we always say this, this the, 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 the idea is always to reintegrate them into an environment where they can continue to get their needs met by in the tier one community. And the way I see it is, you know, if there's a student who is having some difficulties, but they go into their classroom and they can check in, right? Now they can actually check in verbally um, what's, what's going on, even if they're having a rough day and they're checking in as a two or whatever it be, but at least they were able to verbalize it, articulate it instead of just having to act it out. Because that's oftentimes what happens. Kids don't have the opportunity to articulate with, with, their, with their teachers how they're feeling. And so what they do is they act it out. And, they, and through the acting out, it's usually in misbehavior. And then they're punished. You know, they're isolated. And so it's like, no, let's get their needs met in that tier one, right? Let's, what about if that student was really listened to by another student and that's and another student comes to them and says, hey, you know what? I want you to know I'm here for you and whatever I can do. Or what if it's the teacher that goes to them and says, hey, if you'd like to talk, I just want you to know in any way I can support you. I want to. That can make a world of difference for that student. They may not even need to act out and go into tier two or tier three supports. They're getting their needs met in tier one. And I, I, I hope that that, um, you know, makes sense to people. And um, Erica, can you hear me? Yes, I can. What, what, kind of what does that mean to you, uh, this, this whole kind of restorative kind of um, MTSS system? Well, I know that we have talked about using it in our uh, schools. Um, and as a social worker, I kind of, try to go on all the levels, um, you know, develop programs for everyone, but then also the one-on-ones for the tier three. Um, so I guess it's sort of like micro and macro for my work. Um, well, but- thank you, Erica. And, you know, one of the things I was just with some educators this morning, and one of the things And, you know, I don't mean to offend anybody, but this is what came out in the circle. You know, um, a couple of the teachers kind of said, hey, wait a minute, you know, um, when when you as an administrator or you as a support person take one of our students and, and develop a great relationship with them and provide them the supports, you have to remember, you need to bring us into that circle. Because if you don't, what happens is it isolates us. And when the students back in our class, we haven't had a chance to restore. And then what they do is they act out to go back to you because you're the one that they've developed that great relationship. And they understand that it's helpful, but it's what's, what's really essential is that, is that the bridge is built uh, between that student and the teacher, because they're the ones that see them all the time. And sometimes we have to, 
help the teacher build their capacity to understand like why we do these little circles with, with students so we can actually get to know them on a deeper level than just academics. Because just because you teach academics doesn't mean that you have a relationship with your students. When, when you have a relationship with your students, when you listen to them and you, you have that attitude that Laura was talking about earlier, that, that, that you truly believe that they're your greatest resource and that they can sometimes teach you about things that you don't know because you don't know everything. Um, and, and so what we say is that every and every mind, even if it's a nine-year-old mind, they have something to teach us. We just have to bring that out of them, right? And that's the, that's the job of, of, of a facilitator is to try to bring out the wisdom of the circle and that they will teach us. And then when, when they see that we're open to being taught, it builds them up. They begin to say, I have something to offer. You know, I thought I was just a lowly student, but my teacher makes me feel like the teacher. Uh, I'm an important person. I have wisdom. And so that's when, when, when young people begin to transform. And, and the idea is that, that the young people, as Laura was talking about, the greatest resource that we have, that they can start to become the healers of our own school. Um, and we, and, and Laura and I, we're going to share very um, quick, soon, and I know Robert's helped us. Thank you, Robert, for your help with this. But he is putting on our, on our webpage some amazing interviews with, with these former students that talk about that. I mean, it is like life-changing. So just, I hope that, you know, people are understanding this restorative mindset is very, it's a different mindset from an old paradigm where it's, it's, it's like a shift. And then, Anthony, just before we go to that yeah. slide, if it's just uh, just yeah. just a few things with this. I always I, I always really like this this visual because I think it it does say a lot, but I do think sometimes it it um, it sometimes can be um, misleading. It's uh, misinterpreted a, a little bit. Um, so just with with, the, with this one specifically, when we're talking about tiered uh, tiered approaches or supports or interventions. Um, that that emphasis is literally in the prevention in that in that groundwork. Um, it's not a menu of interventions to choose from, like, oh, we want to start doing uh, restorative circles or, or um, integration circles. Well, you don't, it's, you can't literally, uh, as far as uh, uh, with, with Fidelity, jump to that when your tier one prevention uh, practices aren't in place. You're building on, uh, on top of, not selecting from a tier two or a tier three. Um, and also just with the, uh, uh, with that, that student first language, uh, we tier practices, we tier interventions, we tier um, supports, we are not tiering students. There's no such thing as our tier one students or our tier two students. They are students that are receiving a tier one or a, a tier two or a tier three intervention or support. And always a reminder that everybody, universal, everyone is receiving those tier one um, supports and interventions as well. Wow, that was really well put, Robert. Thank you. And uh, thank you for that reminder. And, you know, because one of the, I would say, you know, I guess I would say the, the biggest mistake I've seen in the implementation of restorative justice practices is people go straight to the tier three without doing what you said. You have to lay the foundation of tier one practices for tier two and tier three to be effective. Um, you know, it, it kind of, it would be like this. It reminds me a little bit of like a marriage. You know, if, if you're only paying attention to your spouse when it's like tier three and there's, you're in crisis and you're not doing the tier one kinds of relationship building, taking time to listen and to grow in a relationship, that marriage is going to fall apart. I'm sorry. That's the reality. It's like, and, and, and that's the same thing with a school relationship. We got to do what Robert's talking about. Build the tier one practices as your high priority. Build that strong. And I guarantee you, you are going to be very successful in tier two and tier three. So um, one thing is that, you know, we use this social discipline window to kind of, um, I guess, describe what restorative practices is and what it's not. Um, so by the way, it's not, if you see where the four or the permissive is, if you look where that is, 
It's very um, strong on that support. You see the arrow on the bottom, that's the higher, the further you go to the right on this graphic, the, the, the stronger the support. Uh, but the, the, the higher you go on the graphic, the more control and discipline and limit setting, even like holding the high standard. So if you're super supportive, but you're not holding a high standard, you're, in a, you're, you're becoming permissive and you're not, um, what would I say? You're, 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 you're not actually um, helping that student grow in the way that, that, that they need to. Um, and all of us, you know, we all need to be held accountable. We all need to be responsible. And so sometimes people think, though, the permissive is the restorative, but it's not. Um, the support, yes, it is. But guess what? So is the holding the high standard. That's where the whiff is. Um, we obviously know being punitive and being just, you know, kind of um, controlling and all that. That's not. And, and we know the neglectful is not. But the one that gets confusing for people is they think permissive is. And so, but this is the way I like to explain it. The restorative mindset is one of embracing people where they are. And because we can't control where they're coming from. So we, we just embrace them where they are. That's our job. That's our responsibility. And that is truly equity. If you embrace every student where they're coming from, you're, now you're being equitable. But this is also equity. Am I willing to provide them the supports that they need to be successful? Right? If you're because, you know, if I say, oh, I just embrace you where you are, but I'm not going to provide you supports to actually improve yourself, then what, what's going on? You know, I'm not really um, functioning at a high level as an educator. So what we say is we embrace people where they are, and then we provide them the supports that they need. And the way we um, measure success isn't like, hey, they, they're at a 10 on a 1 to 10 scale. No. We say we ju judge success by a growth mindset. They grow and they, they improve, right? And most special um, education is, you know, uh, special ed teachers and people, they understand this. It's like real growth mindset, you know, but we should have that on the social emotional as well, right? It's growth and you celebrate the growth. You don't like get upset because they're not up here just because you want them to be. That's not a restorative mindset. Um, and, and that's, I know this is hard to swallow. So I, you know, I don't mean any disrespect on it, but I do have to challenge you in some of this. This is this paradigm of a restorative paradigm is very challenging and there's no way around it. It's hard work. I know I try to live this every day and for myself, it's a challenge. Um, and my ego gets in the way sometimes and it's not easy for me, but I, I'm going to keep um, I'm going to keep trying. You know, I'm not, I, I know I'm not going to be attained perfection or something, but, but I'm going to keep trying. So what we want to ask you is, who was that person for you that did the with? Who was the person, especially, you know, if you can identify an educator who took the time to embrace you where you were at a certain age and with all your flaws and all that, but they said, hey, I'm going to help you to improve. Who was that that you can remember? And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to actually go into a, another triad share, and you'll go probably with some different people. And then we're going to you know, ask you to try to identify who that person was, um, K through 12. It may be in college, I don't know, but if you can, K through 12. And if you can't identify anybody, then be honest about that and say it um, and, and, you know, say how you ended up finding your support. So um, I, I want to just identify um, for myself who is that, um, that, that teacher that comes to mind is my eighth grade teacher. And I was actually in a Catholic school. And it was, it was Sister Mary 
Um, and honestly, I do not remember the names of all my other teachers in K through eight. Um, and I don't even remember them in high school. I don't remember their names, but I remember her name because she came to me one day and, and said, Anthony, I'm concerned about you. And I was like, what? You know, she was the first person that ever came to me and said she had any concern like about anything. It, I just never had any teacher before her or after her say that to me. And so I said, well, what's good? What's going on? And she said, well, I don't think you're going to pass the test to get into the high school. And I said, oh, really? And, 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 and she said, I don't think your friends are going to pass either. Um, and I was like, oh, man. And so she goes, but I'll, if, you, if you talk to them and they're willing to come to get tutoring, I'll give you the tutoring for free. You'll have to come after hours and, and, and your parents will have to drop you off at the convent. And all. I said, she said, so go and talk to them. And if they agree, then I'll, I'll do it. And I went to them and, and they all were like, what are you going to do, Anthony? You know, I was like, uh, I guess I'm going to go. And so uh, we all went and, and, and I honestly, I did quite well on that test, almost too well, because I got in the math class with the brainiacs and I, I wasn't quite used to that. And uh, I thought I was in the wrong class. I actually told the teacher, uh, teacher, I think I'm in the wrong class. Um, so, yeah. So Laura, what about you? Who, who was that for you? Well, I would be remiss in not saying that you've been incredibly restorative as a leader. Um, it's not easy to be restorative in a restorative program. There's a lot, a lot weighing on that. Um, so I just want to pay homage Thank to that. Um, and in K through 12, a, uh, my ninth grade teacher, he was a biology teacher. His name's Mr. Decker, Mr. Decker. And he what, checked every single restorative box there could be checked except for its circles, but it just was, uh, this, you know, wasn't the method of learning at that time. Um, he had very high expectations, but he was, and he was also so engaged with the subject matter, you couldn't help but be engaged. Mm -hmm. um, provided opportunities for learning before school and after school, cared so much about his students. And it was at that moment that learning started to click for me as some Something that could be enjoyable, worthwhile. Um, he had these three words: passion, quality, commitment on his around his um, classroom walls, and he reflected that in his teaching method. I took marine science my senior year because I loved biology so much. With his teacher, I just really wanted to take his class, and he um, took us on a trip at the end of the year to Monterey, where I developed a new appreciation for the environment. Um, but he had committees assigned student committees assigned to different responsibilities, like what to bring, what to pack, um, who was going to go in what car. So we actually organized the trip ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. What an yeah. amazing teacher. Uh, right. Oh, I, I forced my youngest brother. I was like, whatever you do, do you, but take Mr. Decker. <laughs> and he <laughs> then ended up majoring in marine science in college because of the similar impact. Amazing, that, the impact. Thank you, Laura. What about you, Robert? That's good stuff. I like it. Mm -hmm. For for me, the the, the teacher that came uh, the online came to mind. It was my uh, my high school music teacher director, and I had him for all all four years. So we'd have uh, different programs going on, depending at the fall or the spring. So we had marching band or orchestra, jazz, uh, musicals. And especially now that I, think they, I don't know how he did it all while also, uh, you know, uh, having a, a family of his own, but he was just always there. You know, he made, he made sure that we had, uh, we, there was a, a very high expectation, just made sure, you know, these are our, our, uh, our rehearsal hours. I'll have the, the band rooms open, you need to re read and rehearse, you need an instrument, you need a uniform, you need whatever, I'll help you out with that. But you also, there was a high expectation on you as a student to, to follow through because there was no one else that was going to be able to do your part. If you committed to this, he'll be committed to you as well. And it also created uh, a, a just, we all kind of, I think uh, at the time just thought, oh, he's just a strict teacher without really realizing, oh, no, there was some some strategy behind this. And it really created that sense of accountability to each other as, as well as just a uh, controlled uh, environment to learn that personal development and, and responsibility while also uh, doing something that was that was creative. So I 
Uh, I still have him on, on, on Facebook as a friend and things like that. But definitely, I think as I, as I get older, I just really appreciate that. Like, he did not have to do that, but was uh, definitely that, 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 uh, that positive restorative role model that I didn't even know really what restorative was at the time, but really lived it. Wow, that is amazing, right, Laura? It's like oh, this yeah. big impact, right? Can you imagine, I mean, that, that he had that teacher for four years? Wow. Very fortunate. And the Those lessons, things. the lessons that, that you were able to, that he was able to teach you were just off the charts. I mean, they were just amazing. Absolutely. Um, you know, like that responsibility to the team and everything. Thank you, Robert, for sharing that. I'm going to ask Audrey to just share. And then, Samantha, would you be willing to share as well after Audrey about just your experience in the small group? Thank you. Okay, Audrey? Yeah. So, um, my experience wasn't actually in um, K through 12, it was in college. My German teacher um, was actually there for me when I was uh, going through some losses in my family. Mm -hmm. And she actually pushed me to get back on track in my education and help me raise all my grades. So it was really nice of her. That's powerful, right? Yeah. It sounds like your German teacher went above and beyond. Um, yeah, she did. That's mm -hmm. often the case. So thank you. And then Samantha, what about you? Uh, I talked about my second grade teacher, uh, Ms. Chiquete. Um, she helped me learn English when I came to this country um, and just made the biggest impact on me and was my inspiration towards studying education and wanting to be a teacher. Wow. How powerful is that, right? And you still have that clear memory of her, just so mm -hmm. powerful. And then, um, Joel, what about you? What, what's, what did you think of in, in your small group? There we go. Yeah, mine in my small group was uh, my baseball coach in high school. You know, he kind of saw me going in the wrong direction. And, um, you know, I was missing practice. So he reached out, you know, came over to my house, you know, saw what was going on, you know, kind of like had me come back to practice more often, you know, not miss practice. And then, um, you know, kind of helped me with my school. Like he would help me with, um, you know, some of my schoolwork when I needed help. So basically I was a, a coach for me in high school. Wow. Thank you. And then it sounds like that coach also went above and beyond to be in, in to really care for you. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, he did go above and beyond. And it wow. helped out a lot, too, and it helped me get back on track so I could um, graduate. I hope people are listening to this. These are the people that have made the difference in their lives, have helped them become better human beings. Um, Adriana, what about you? In, in, did you share? Yeah, um, I didn't have one. It was school, but he was a retired English teacher who was a family friend. Mm -hmm. And I think just the wanting to keep... Um, hold me accountable for doing things and wanting to see a finished product and for me it was I would never want him to let him down so I always kept on striving to do better and better because I wanted to make him proud and know that I was trying and I was succeeding and um, it was the best decision I've made. Wow Adriana thank you for <laughs> sharing that you know you know what really hit me is because I've heard so many people say I didn't want to let him down because they actually developed a relationship with you um, like that was so special that there was no way you were going to let them down. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, yeah. It was, it was really good because I didn't learn to read or write until I'm, I was in third grade. So it was really difficult. Um, and along the way, over the years, uh, we built a really good relationship and he was there for my high school graduation and my college graduation. And it was just a sense of accomplishment and just to hear it from them, it just makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, it sounds like it was a really long-term relationship, a true mentoring that happened. Yeah, he was a great family friend and he, he you know, still holds me accountable to this day. So uh -huh. I'm very, very happy to have him around. Yeah, what a gift. Thank you. <laughs> and Jay, what about you? Is it, were you able to remember anybody? Yeah, I was able to share. I actually, uh, my high school principal, um, her name is Estelle Kassebaum. Um, and um, for the most part, I didn't think about my principal at all, except when I was getting in trouble. Um, I was kind of a, a class clown and a, a goof off and stuff. 
And I shared that I actually got ended up getting kicked out of high school for some behavior issues. Um, and it was the way that she dealt with me and held me accountable um, that really helped me. Um, I, because of the list of things that I had done, that was the consequence. But she was like, I'm not just going to kick you out and that's the end of it and you're gone. She's like, I want you to come back, but you're going to have to do these things to come back. And she challenged me and she held me accountable. Um, I graduated back at the school, Marion High School. Um, and uh, even after graduation, she was someone who, whenever I would come into town, I don't even know how she knew I was in town, but she would find, she, she would contact me and let's get together and do lunch. Tell me about, you know, what's going on, how's school going. Um, she unfortunately passed away several years ago. Um, but she's somebody who I don't think necessarily inspired me to be into education, but getting into education, she's somebody who I think of often and who I think would be proud of the person that I've become. And um, I kind of have in the back of my head that feeling like I don't want to let her down. She's not around anymore, but I still feel that in the back of my head. Like I know that she would be proud of me. I know that she's kind of looking over and watching uh, kind of with a smile, so. Wow, that, I, Jay, that, it was extremely powerful to hear. I feel like so filled with, I don't know, some kind of appreciation, um, gratitude for her, it's just powerful. So um, thank you for sharing. And by the way, Jay, I, I felt like what you did is you helped remind us of, of that indigenous spirit of we don't forget our ancestors and they don't have to be blood family. The people who loved us, right? We, they're our ancestors. They're part of our family. And, and, and I can hear clearly that she's connected to you and that you're not forgetting her. You know what I mean? That's the way the indigenous spirit is. And so that's what we're trying to do is restore that powerful feeling that we're in a circle, even with our ancestors, we just have to remember it because the indigenous people have always remembered that and you're helping us remember. So thank you. Um, all right. So let's, why don't we, this is very powerful, by the way. Thank you, everybody. It's amazing. Um, so why thank don't we take a word on the chat too? Yeah, it's amazing. I'm just, God, it's kind of overwhelming. So, but I think I could use maybe a five minute break, give myself a little emotional break here. Um, and, and so we'll come back, you know, about just a few minutes after three, and then we'll finish up our last section. So have a nice break. It's, a, it's important to, um, to know that all of us have different reactions to conflict, right? Um, uh, there are some of us that, you know, really go into avoidance or maybe we withdraw, um, uh, there's some of us that will go on the attack of others. Um, and then some of us actually attack self. And so, uh, but I, I want us to think about, I'm, I'm sure if you've been serving young people in schools or in, in community services, you, you've probably seen some of this, right? Where, where maybe you were trying to help out a student to, to see what was going on with a, a conflict that, or maybe something that they had done or something like that. And then you, you see them kind of go into this, what we call compass of shame. And the, the withdrawal means like, you know, when you're with us with a young person and then they kind of shut down, they're with you physically, but they're really not with you. Um, it's kind of like, you know, emotionally disconnecting. Um, and avoidance is a little bit similar, but it's avoidance oftentimes is like not showing up at the class or not going to your appointment, not, not showing up at school, not, you know, avoiding, but also using drugs and alcohol to avoid. Um, that's also a form of avoidance. And then, um, and then sometimes, you know, we'll see people really go on the attack of others. So they, they're, they uh, kind of a button is pushed or a switch goes off for them. Like a, it might be something that's traumatized them in the past. And all of a sudden though, they, they, to feel a bit of control, they go on the attack rather than look at themselves. It's more comfortable to go on the attack of others. And so they might even go on attack of you. They might call you names. 
They might say things about your school, your organization um, that they probably don't really feel, but they're just, it's like just shooting wild. And then um, sometimes you'll hear students or young people go on this attack of self. They'll say things like, yeah, I'm so dumb. I'm so stupid. Um, you know, I'm not a good, I'm not a good person. I'm, I'm a bad guy or, you know, things like that. You'll be, and then sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll actually see that some young people will actually go into hurting themselves, like cutting. Right. Um, and then even to the point, obviously, of like an extreme point would be a, a suicidal ideation, something like that. So what we um, wanted to ask you, so it, like in order for us to become more understanding um, and more empathetic with young people, we need to look in ourselves that we all have these things. Like I know for myself, you know, I uh, sometimes I'll avoid or withdraw. There's been times that I've honestly done all of these, right? Um, I've attacked others. Um, so, but just think about you. What, what's, what's your go-to most of the time in, 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 in different relationships that you might have? Um, what do you do when there's, when conflict arises? Maybe you're accused of something, maybe you're caught doing something. Um, what's your go-to on that? And then, so we ask you, you know, this question, what's your typical response to shame? And then we're asking you to share in the chat, whatever your comfort level is, what if you, you know, so your typical response would be like one of these. And then, and then, you know, what's the best way, this is the most important part of this question, by the way, what's the best way a person you trust can help you through a conflict? So, um, you know, for myself, it's, I really appreciate going to somebody who I trust and that they'll actually listen to me without judging me. Um, that's important to me. If I feel judged, I shut down. I don't want to be with that. It's like, you can't help me. If you judge me, honestly, I don't even want to be around you. So, um, but every, all of us, you know, there's certain things that can really help us um, during the conflict. So I want you to focus, if you would, on that, on what's the best way a person you trust can help you through conflict. And, um, and if you would, just in the chat, just go ahead and, and, and put that in there. And let's just see what comes up. Attack others, validation of small accomplishments, unbiased, honest guidance that's accountable, intentional for improvement. Joshua, that is a great response. Thank you so much. <clears throat> validation of small accomplishments. And remember, that's that uh, validating the growth mindset, right? Small accomplishments, not being biased. So, so thank you, Melinda, um, for, for your response. Thank you, Tamara. Um, she wants active listening, non-judgmental. I totally agree with that. Someone, and, and Melinda says, someone who will listen to me. Um, talk through my issue and not offer advice unless I ask for it. So I want you all to kind of let Melinda teach us something right now. See what she's saying there. Sometimes people don't want you to give the, your advice of how to fix it let, until they're ready. Um, so Melinda, would you be comfortable saying a little bit more about that? Because that's an important point you make. Absolutely. Um... I'm trying to think of an example, but it, it actually really bothers me when people want to just give me advice when I'm sharing with something, because it doesn't mean that I'm asking for advice. It just means that I need you to listen. And it's nice because I actually have a few friends who are really good and they'll say, okay, wait, do you want me to listen or do you want advice? Mm -hmm. And so I'll just tell them, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll take your advice when I'm done talking here. <laughs> but um, it's, it's hard to get people just to listen yeah. without offering up their opinion. <laughs> so and Melinda, I have to confess, I, I struggled with that for many years mm -hmm. um, as a, as a man, I, I almost felt like I was wired to just, when I listen to the, somebody telling me a problem they're having, 
my immediate thing is, okay, what, what can we do to fix this? Or what, you know, mm-hmm. so it's almost like when you're fixing a car, you know, it's like, I got to just be a mechanic with this, but that's not what people want. Right. And, and in some ways you're almost disrespecting them to tell them, Hey, if you just do a, B and C, it's going to get better. Um, yeah. Thank you, Melinda, for being so um, authentic like that. Absolutely. And then so you can see that, look at, if you don't mind, once you put your response in, look at what other people are saying and, and try to just learn from them. Um, you know what I mean? Like, listen to what they're saying, and then you'll find this is probably what most people want from you when they come to you with a problem. And I, I like what um, Leah's saying is like, you know, um, remind me that one situation does not alone define me or my life. God, Leah, are you willing to talk a little bit about that, Leah? Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's just pretty straightforward. But sometimes um, I said I, I attack myself and I'll do that with negative thoughts and negative self-talk. And then somebody just needs to remind me hey, that's not, that's not your whole life. That was one thing that happened. And also kind of remind me that um, if I wouldn't speak about somebody else in that way, I should not be speaking about myself in that way either. So I like to try to switch that perspective and just remember to treat myself as well as I would treat my best friend and my family and people who I love. So, yeah. Yeah, that is a great, great um thing to do. And thank you for that advice. That's wonderful. Um, So I hope that you're looking through these, um, you know, we can learn a lot from our colleagues when they're authentic, as you're seeing in the chat right here. Um, Because this is authenticity. This is what the restorative circle brings out. It brings out wisdom from our own circle members, right? And so we can learn so much if you just um, and by the way, we will we will do our best to save the chat. I believe Robert, we're going to do our best to save this chat and send it to them. Yep. Thank you. Um, that's very valuable because there's so much as I as I read through these right now. I'm just going, my goodness, there's so much wisdom. So again, thank you everybody for that. And then um, if if you look at this list right here, what's the top thing? <laughs> Listen. You know, be present with them without trying to problem solve. And that's that's what Melinda was telling us. And then Leo was telling us the last one. But Leah, I know this isn't exactly what you were saying, but it reminds me of what you were saying. Teach to talk to themselves as they would someone they love. Because um, when you were telling us that, I was going, oh, yeah, it reminds me of that last bullet point on here. So here's some, you know, there's some good good advice here as well. But I think the, the chat is just full of great advice. And so in restorative practices, one of the things we like to do is to try our best to develop a fair process in our organization, right? And or in our department or in our team, so that people feel that when they bring things, that things are addressed fairly. Um, And so it says individuals are more likely to trust and cooperate freely with systems, whether they themselves win or lose by those systems when fair process is observed. So uh, something else now I want to ask you um, within, uh, within the chat, if you would, is what has to exist within a process within your organization, your team, your department, your whatever? What has to exist for you? to feel like it's fair, the process is fair. So if you would in the chat, just put in there um, just one thing that you feel like must be uh, included for you to say, you know what, it was a fair process. And let's just see what people's comments are here. To feel heard, look what Jay says, right? That first thing on that list that we just we just saw and then and then Tamara says, equitable, excellent. And then Laura says, expectations and values are clear. Everyone has a voice. Thank you, Laura. That's, that's really important. And Laura, would you be willing to just share a moment on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so typically in circle, 
uh, there are expectations, like in this, pro like in this, um, I guess we call it circle training, um, expectations were laid out or guidelines and we each had a say and I saw individuals, you know, put in the chat beautiful expectations or guidelines that resonated with me to make me feel safe. So I didn't feel the need to add in. Um, and then that, since that's out there and we're all, we're all reading and we're all buying in and we put our thumbs up, um, that's very, very clear. And knowing that I feel um, safer to be vulnerable. Wow. I love that, Laura. Thank you. You see how, how, how community agreements, how important that was for Laura to have something clearly spelled out, but it brought in the voice of the people. And then everybody had a chance to say, yes, I agree. So understand that, understand what she's saying is really important. If you want your classroom to feel like the, stu the students feel that it's more fair, then enlist their voice, their ideas, put them up on some kind of paper or something to show like, hey, I honor your ideas. You are important to me. So yeah, just really um, well said, thank you. So when we say affective communication, typically what we're saying is that it's a way of communicating to be able to set boundaries, it provides feedback, it shows human impact and teaches empathy because what you're doing with affective communication is you are actually communicating how that behavior affected you. It, it impacted your, you know, as a, as a human being, right? And so you're not like communicating, you know, in a way that you're kind of putting people down, like you're just lazy or stop being so disruptive. You're, you're still holding people accountable, but you're doing it with, with clarity, kind of the, what, what, what you heard from Laura right now. She wants to have things clearly spelled out. So in this, on that top um, example, it says, when I heard you speaking to Marcos the way you did, I felt concerned. You hear, did you see that? I felt concerned. There's the feeling. Because we agreed that we value respect. And that, by the way, reverts back to those community agreements that, that Laura was talking about. And then the, the, the request comes in, would you be willing to speak more respectfully with others, right? So it doesn't have to be word for word like any of these. There's a couple of other examples, but you know, it doesn't have to be word for word. But the idea is that you, you provide an observation, a feeling, a need, and a request. And it can be, it's a more effective effective, you know, with an E way of communicating. And, and um, so we talked about the restorative questions within the, within the, um, the, the continuum of restorative practices. And, you know, why are we using questions like restorative questions? And um, Laura, would you, would you be willing to read these for us where it says restorative questions? Sure thing. Um designed to be open-ended and non-judgmental to help people reflect and express their role in harmful situations, provides people with the opportunity to educate us what they are thinking rather than us making assumptions. The first step toward healing is to provide a safe environment where people trust that they will be heard and accepted as they are. Thank you, Laura. And then is there any part of this that resonates a little bit more deeply with you? Well, it's interesting because in my, um, the compass of shame, I go towards attacking myself. And when asked what others can do to support me, when I go to that place, it is to um, be accepted and, um, and trusted that where I am is just, is okay. It's enough. So that third point, that would be, and you know, if there was any harm, just to clearly let me know, hey, this is what happened. And right now there's not a lot you can do. Just know that this is just a moment, like Leah said, I love that. And it doesn't define you, or this is the thing, this is what you can do um, to repair that harm. But yeah, so just being ex um, accepted. That's and beautiful. Heard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, what's cool is like, you know, oftentimes, you know, somebody does something wrong, we want to tell them first, like what the way we kind of judge them in some ways. 
But this is saying, wait, wait, first just ask questions so you can learn more rather than assuming that you know the whole thing, right? It's like, to, to and, and if you start with questions, you're actually going to be open to learning. If you start with kind of um, attacking kind of statements, you're, you're going to shut them down and you yourself are going to go into attack mode, which is going to shut you down. And so these are some of the restorative questions, right? Um, so when, you're, when your uh, questions responding to challenging behavior, you don't have to ask these exact things word for word, but this is a guide. It's like a template. Um, but many educators, and even today in the morning, I had educators telling me, yeah, I use these questions and they really help in my relationship with students. So it's what happened? What were you thinking of at the time? You know, what have you thought about since? Who has been affected by what you've done? In what way? And what do you think you need to do to make things right? So you're giving them the chance to reflect and think about even themselves, how they might be able to restore the situation. And then um, this one's to help those, who, um, you know, the, who were harmed by others. So, you know, what did you think when you realized what had happened? What impact has this incident had on you and others? Um, what has been the hardest thing for you? Um, and what do you think needs to happen to make things right? And, you know, oftentimes when somebody's harmed, like in the schools, for example, the, the, the student who did the harm is brought in and they're, they're, you know, they're punished, they're disciplined. Okay. They, and yet oftentimes the person who was harmed is never actually involved in being able to process what happened. You know, one of the greatest things that I've seen about these questions is that when, when the two students are able to be brought together and they've been asked these questions, they've been prepped and sometimes they've been, they wrote the answers out and then they come together and then they read those questions, the, the answers back to the person who was harmed and the person who did the harm. And it gives them like, for example, the, what I've seen, the people who were harmed when they, when they hear what that person was thinking and, and what they thought about since what, what the, the, that in itself almost seems like this restoring healing process, because most of the time, the people who were harmed are thinking it's going to happen again. Oh my God, you know, they hate me. They, 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 they're after me and, and stuff like that. But oftentimes it was something really different from what they were thinking. And this actually clarifies it um, for them. It's amazing in appropriate kinds of situations when you do this, it's really quite a, a, a restorative um, ex experience for everybody. So um, what we wanted to do was show you a video of, um, I'm gonna stop the share for a moment here. Um, we wanna show you a video of a woman who goes into a prison and, and, and this woman, obviously, gender-wise, she's obviously different. But if you look racially and um, you would think experien you know, experientially, you know, she's not going to be able to relate with them. But what I want you to see is how this woman, how well she connects with these prisoners that she puts in a huge circle. And then they go into a smaller circle indoors. And I, I really want you to see that this woman is strategic in the way she um, tries to connect with these, with these men. And, um, and then I want you to listen to them, these men, as they report back how, how the experience with her, what it did with them and how it brought them together. So let me um, now share the screen again here.
It's time now, everyone. We're going to do the Compassion Trauma Circle. Is everyone ready to face their past with compassion? Is that a yes? yes? While you were growing up, during your first 18 years of life, if a parent or other adult in the household often or very often would swear at you, insult you, put you down or humiliate you, step inside the circle. If a parent or other adult in the household often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or threw something at you, step inside the circle. If a parent or other adult in the household often or very often ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured, step inside the circle. If you often felt that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special, step inside the circle. If your family lived in extreme poverty, step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. I was abused as a young girl. I was beaten by my mother. I was verbally abused by my mother. I was sexually abused by another man. My father was an alcoholic. My mother was a rageaholic. I've driven drunk. I've sold drugs. I was a juvenile delinquent. Probably my story is similar to most of your stories in here. I'm white and I'm female and I didn't, nothing happened to me. So, you know, I got a get out of jail free card. And so I'm here now because I see myself in every one of you. I'm a traumatized child, raised by a traumatized child. My mother was traumatized as well as her parents. Like he said, we wasn't born in the world of being evil people. My mother didn't want me. She hid her pregnancy. She tried to flush me down the toilet. But as I learned about these things, I always asked myself what was wrong with me. When I come to the circle and I see everybody else and she's reading off the questions and people step it in further, and I look at my childhood and I'm like, a lot of these people in this yard are just like me. There was one step I should have taken that I didn't take and I saw some of my brothers and my friends take that step and I felt like such a coward. You know, I wasn't brave enough to be there with them when they took that step. and. Um, Every round after that, I, I took the most difficult step. Our traumas kept us separated. We were all on the circumference, all standing apart. But once we began to acknowledge our traumas publicly, it brought us all closer together. In prison, you're not supposed to show your weaknesses in prison, though. But to, 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 to want to do that, to walk in that circle like that, and to take each step forward was a reminder to ourselves that we still have a humanity and we worthy to be loved, though. Most people on the outside don't understand that we want to change so we can re-enter society better than what we left it. And I think one of the things that when you was yelling at no shame and you had us yelling it out, it was freeing us too. And it was a point to where when I was looking at that and we was all looking at it, in a circle you can hear that echo, no shame. And that was very powerful especially coming from a little lady like you. <laughs> I'm 76 years old. I've seen a lot. I don't like talking. I like to meet people that understand what's happening without words, and you one of them. Today has been one of the best days I had in my whole entire life.
And, and so, you know, here you have this woman come into this environment that is very, seems very unlike her, but I, what I'd like you to do is think about what, what did she do to be able to connect with these people that oftentimes society wants to just throw away, doesn't want to see, they want them just invisible, um, but she went in <laughs> And, and, and she did this work with them and she used the power of the circle um, to do that. And so I'd like you to think about that, like just something helpful that you saw in this video. And if you would just go ahead and put that in the chat um, and, then, um, and then we can see, you know, some, some, some people's thoughts. So she showed there was commonality amongst what appeared to be a circle of vast differences. God, thank you, Jay. What a great comment. <laughs> That's exactly what she did. She was honest and brave. Laura, Laura, thank you. Uh, Melissa says she had a beautiful balance of acknowledging her differences and being vulnerable with some similarities. The way she shared her own trauma history was never comparative, only vulnerable and honest. Wow, Melissa. Great share. Um, Melinda says she allowed herself to be vulnerable. So you, you, you guys, you're all kind of catching that. That's great. She was willing to be vulnerable and share her own experiences. She allowed everyone to choose to step forward and be vulnerable. So just go ahead and read through these comments. They're, they're fantastic. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for your sharing. And then another question would be this, um, you know, all those students, all, all those men that we saw in there, they probably all came through our schools, right? So what's something that we can do now in our schools, like, you know, tomorrow or whenever they come back to school, what's one thing that you suggest that schools could do to help to, to not allow them to take on so much shame and so much destruction that takes them down, even though I know that many of them came from horrendous family experiences, but what's something that, that you feel the schools can do to help to restore them, to heal them, so they don't have to go through all the way to prison, and then ultimately, who knows how long they're going to have to be warehoused there. So if you don't mind, just go ahead and share some of your ideas in the chat on that one. Being more transparent and acknowledging the ACE scores um, of their students right on. Um, I completely agree with you in developing programs to support them. Thank you, Joshua. So he's saying, go ahead and use that, that same thing that she was using, right? The, um, um, that whole kind of like, <laughs> almost like acknowledging the traumas that are out there and then developing programs to respond. So let your kids know through your actions that there is nothing they could do um, that they could do that uh, would change your opinion of them. In other words, build a positive relationship where you care for them unconditionally. Wow. Thank you, Melissa. My God, this, this group is something else. Um, and then Casey says, make them feel loved and cared for, especially they, if they don't feel um, at, if they don't feel it at home. School um, may be the only place that they do. Right on, Casey. Thank you. Julie says to, to let them know that they are worthy of love and acceptance just the way they are. God, such fantastic wisdom from this group. Um, include family restorative circles, Brittany says. Thank you. Wow, what a, what a great um, insight, Brittany. And Tamara says that social emotional learning, how important that is, right? To continue with that, thank you. Um, our students need to know we all care about them and don't judge them. Thank you, Melinda. 
And then Rosa agrees with, uh, with Tamara with the social emotional learning, um, consistent policy and practices, Tamara adds on to that. And Tara says, create a positive, loving community and safe space at school. It's everything you're all saying is just fantastic. Um, Jay says, consistency, transparency, open communication. These, these should all be like, I, don't, I know it's, you can't mandate all of this, but, I, but it should be like daily practice, right? In our schools, everything you're saying, I'm going, man, this is like truly a healing community when you do the things that you're all saying, where even when people are coming from the most broken families where they felt demeaned and devalued in their own home, they can come to a school and they can go, I'm cared for. I'm accepted for who I am, even if my grades are the worst, right? Even if I'm not showing, oh, I'm, you know, they're going to become the valedictorian or whatever, but it's like people are embraced for the human dignity that they truly have, that every human being has. Can you imagine if we did that? How powerful, I mean, how many, how many of those men would not end up in prison? Um, where they could actually discover their beauty, <laughs> their, their, their wonder as a human being right at school through you, through me, right? That's the, that's the, that's the power of, of, of what we're talking about with restorative practices. So just please make sure you look through these amazing comments. Oh, my goodness. Um, just so good. All right. So... Um, one thing we wanted to do is, um, Robert, would you kind of just share with them some of the resources so that they kind of know, you know, what, what we have now? There we go. So I'm going to include in our chat, um, it's going to be our main, uh, a link to our main San Diego County Office of Ed's uh, Restorative Practices, Restorative Justice Practices um, website. Let me do a share as well. Just one moment. So our, um, our current flyers for the 2021-22 school year can be found there. And while you're doing that, Robert, I did want to mention to them that you're helping us to, um, when we're done with those videos that, that uh, Laura and I and others are working on, you're helping us put those on the web page. Yes, and I'll, show, I'll be able to guide where we'll be able to find those as well. But is this sharing, is this um, yes. your screen open on your end? Perfect. Uh, so just a reminder about our tiered approach to restorative practices and implementation, but all of our uh, our workshop flyers can be found on this main uh, main site. Click on here and it'll bring you to a, a PDF. So feel free to share that PDF um, with, uh, with all of your colleagues. I do wanna uh, point out that we do have an updated flyer that was a bit of a typo on one of our training dates, but all, if you have already, um, use this flyer to reg register all the OMS links are were correct. Um, but if you are going to be sharing any, um, any of these flyers to so please use um, the most updated version on our website. Um, a link to our resource page can be found in the upper right. So let's see here, a quick click. And did that update on your end? Yes. yes. There we go. So you'll be finding some more additional resources here. Um, that will include our, some of our video resources, as well as some of those, um, some of our templates as well. So I know today we shared, oh, we're talking a bit more about tomorrow with some of our, um, our best circles practices, um, but that template that we use just to show all of uh, from where our participants um, came from today can be found here as well. So it's gonna be, um, if you don't bookmark it, just an SDCOE RP is gonna bring you to our, our main page. And that's where you'll find our, uh, our contact info and any of our, um, our most recent um, training flyers. Um, we are planning on including a couple more uh, as well. Um, that are in development. Uh, Anthony, if you want to talk a little bit more about maybe the uh, the trainer of trainers model, um, but all the, again, all that registration info is going to be able to be found here on our main website. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, we'll, we'll be. Um, you know, I, I think in, in the people that go through this these initial trainings um, will invite you if you're interested in developing becoming a trainer yourself, basically. So. Um, yeah, this is something that we're going to, you know, I, I would say only, you know, very engaged, committed people should come to that training. Like, you know, um, you're going to need to be really engaged in that kind of a, a training. So, um, but we will have uh, those, we'll post those up and, um, 
And I'm looking forward to those videos that we're going to have these different video series that we're uh, right now developing, and they're exciting. They're things that we hope that you'll share with others. Um, yeah, so just kind of check in on that. Um, I, I would say, Robert, when do you think that the, the those new videos would be on there? Um, probably before within the next uh, within the next week for sure. Oh, great, thank you. So um, what we'd like to do now is kind of like just a closing circle. And if you, and by the way, if, please, if you get a chance, go ahead and fill out our, um, the training evaluation. It provides us feedback and it's something that we can share with our bosses about, you know, how people feel about the trainings. And um, so, yeah, we always appreciate and we look at all of the feedback. And then, um, so, so now we're kind of like, you know, kind of at the end. And what we would like to do is, is, is just have you um, maybe share one sort of like one thought about something you're taking from this experience of our community coming together like this. Um, and may, may have been something you heard from a colleague or something you saw in the chat or a video or just anything that you feel like, you know what, just resonated with me and I'm taking this with me. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, just take a moment to um, include that in the chat. And as those responses come, I'll, I'll, I'll share mine out, out loud. But um, I, I'm just always impressed by, uh, uh, by this restorative work as, as it really does model those, um, those concepts of inclusivity and diversity, especially just in this training, how, how, how uh, that, that diverse audience from, you know, the Comprehensive schools, alternative education programs, our CBOs, our youth development. Um, every single, you know, it seems like every single uh, child care agency has been re representative just in this training alone, and it really just shows that this work is is broad and needs everybody. And that all the uh, the solutions answered are not housed any one player in it's, any one place, and it's a uh, a collaborative effort for sure. Absolutely, thank you, Robert. <clears throat> And, um, and thank you, um, I see some of those comments coming in. And um, Brittany, I, I see yours always seek to understand and reassure others and never assume. And Brittany, would you be willing to just speak on that for a moment? Hello, yes. Um, so always seeking to understand. Um, so definitely that's never assuming. So um, whether that's a colleague um, or whether that's one of our students, um, especially our students never assuming um, their reactions or their behavior, but always asking those questions, um, why, how, what's wrong, um, and seeking that understanding, and then also reassuring others. So I heard a lot in this training um, that others want to feel accepted. And so just reassuring my colleagues and my students as well. That's powerful. Thank you, Brittany. And, and Linda, I, I was just reading your comment, it's very powerful, um, just about empowering young people and helping them to discover themselves as leaders and great resources. Would you speak on that? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. I feel that, you know, especially when you're working with youth in a program that serves them, they have every right to be a part of the, you know, implementation of that program. And, and when you motivate them and you, show them that you trust that they're as you know the great resources that they are they feel further you know empowered to to do the work and and to be a part of the community because they feel like they belong a part um belong in the community with themselves that's powerful yes and i think we that should be practiced throughout every classroom every program that serves youth. I think Linda, you're right on because if they, like you said, if we, if we empower them, they begin to see themselves as leaders and then they actually will do the work, right? They will be the ones to restore and heal other young people. And they're, they're, they're such powerful, powerful people, um, human beings. So um, just all, look at all these different, um, comments, give, student, give students an opportunity to identify with the compass of shame and define their needs for support. Um, Joshua, would you be willing to make a comment on that? When we did that as a prompt, I found that that was very empowering. And if we're trying to implement a system, 
what I really liked within the language of like all the different slides was it was people, not students. And it's reminding us that we're all people, that we're all human and we all have a right to, you know, ask for the help that we want and in the way that we want it. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you for reminding us, right? We're all people and, and that value that we bring. Um, thank you. And then Julie, would you be willing to share that you said just a reminder that at every interaction, we have an opportunity to change someone's life for the better? Um, I was thinking about, you know, starting with that video and then um, the first video we saw and then followed by the, the second video and just our, our interactions and in our, in our breakout rooms, even um, how just every opportunity we have when we come in contact with another human being, it's just an opportunity to, to choose to make their, their life better. You are so right on. And do, when we're intentional, right? We're just intentionally there for them and with them. We have that ability to do that great healing work. So thank you. And um, I'm reading Lara's as well. I'm amazed um, how connected I feel with this community of exquisite professionals. Well, I love that you said it that way. Um, I take away the insight gain that community can be formed within online virtual platforms as well as in, as well as in person. This warms my heart. And Lara, would you be willing to share about that? I've attended multiple trainings and been a part of multiple circles in person. And it's hard to get away from sort of that additional physical element of being in the room and feeling the space. And, um, you know, when the tears come, we're all just seeing those tears just, you know, wash down our face and it's really powerful. Uh, I was amazed at how connected I felt within this online platform. To me, it did not feel like three hours. It felt pretty quick um, because by virtue of the fact that I was really listening to what others were sharing and learned so much that it's hard to pick out just one thing in particular. So overall, I, I like, hey, we can do this online. So whatever happens in, in the next few years, community can be formed, period. So Wow. Thank you, Laura, for giving us that hope that I felt that too, by the way. Um, I was like, wow, this group is really awesome. Um, I just felt connected and I felt, you know, you know what, honestly, what I think it was, was authentic sharing. I could feel it. I could like literally feel it as I was reading comments, as I was listening to you all, I was like going, man, it's like, it's like really touching my heart. And, and, and it's, and, and that, that proved to me exactly what you just said, Laura, that even in this format, if we're authentic, human authenticity can be felt, right? If you just are willing to, to, to do that, open your heart and be real. Um, and, and, and honestly, young people really respond to that. Um, and, and, and they, and many of you, even when you talked about those people who made a difference in your life, you kind of also talked about how authentic and, and giving and loving they were, right? And they, they changed your lives. They made you better human beings in some ways. So um, I just really, really appreciate all of that. I hope that, you know, you all, you will, will kind of take a, take a quick scan of the, of the great comments and, um, and we'll be sending you those, the, the chat and the PowerPoint and the resources. And I want to thank Robert for, putting all that together for us. I mean, you're just amazing. Uh, everything you're doing is like, you know, I know he, he says, I do the technical stuff, but he just makes it so much better. So thank you. So everybody have a great rest of your afternoon. We appreciate you all. Um, enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you.